I'm Gary Seegers. Catch me on Twitter at GaryWCE. And I'm Chris Giannini. Follow me at Chris B. Giannini. And this is the Winning Cures Everything podcast from winningcureseverything.com. In the last episode of Winning Cures Everything, number 111, you heard Gary's tryout for the Grizzlies Arena announcer gig. We talked the Barstool versus Outkick feud, and we dove into what we make of the Zeke Elliott suspension. Winning Cures Everything. Here are your hosts, Gary and Chris. Welcome in, Winning Cures Everything, number 112. This is the Friday, August 18th edition of the show. I'm Gary. I'm Chris. On today's show, we welcome in Chris Felica from ESPN's College Game Day and the Behind the Bets podcast, and we jump all over the map. We're talking Super Bowl odds, we're talking Mayweather-McGregor, we're talking uh, all, all sorts of stuff. Notre Dame, uh, I don't even know what all we're talking about, man. We got the Friday Five. The Friday Five. That's going to be good. We're talking about collegefootballanalytics.com or cfbanalytics.com and their predictions for the SEC 2017 season. We're talking about SEC coaches and other conference coaches at Ole Miss stuff. We we got the whole thing here. We have got everything that you as a sports fan could uh could possibly want to listen to. Now before we do anything. Let's do the rundown so that you know how to contact us. WinningCuresEverything.com is the website. Go check it out. we got all sorts of stuff up there. Give us a like on Facebook, Facebook.com slash WinningCuresEverything. We are on Twitter, at WinningCures. You can follow me, at GaryWCE. You follow me at Chris B. Giannini. You can email the show. That is WinningCuresEverything at gmail.com. You can download, subscribe to, and review the podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, TuneIn, SoundCloud, Google Play, all your favorite podcast apps. Uh, make sure and give us a review. Every 25 that we get, we're donating to St. Jude and Le Bonner, so knock that thing out. Uh, you can also find us on Local X on Tuesdays and Fridays at 9 a.m. Go ahead and do a little show announcement, breaking news. Doo-doo-doo. We are going to a daily show format on the podcast. Now... We will start that next week. And I hope that you guys download them all. (laughs) Local X will remain unchanged for now. Uh, Every Tuesday and Friday, hour-long show. Check that thing out. It's going to be fun. Um, But for now, today's show is brought to you by Builder's Choice. The best and most cost-effective in flooring for your home or business in the Memphis area. They specialize in hardwood, carpet, and tile. For all your flooring needs at fantastic prices... Give them a call at 901-602-6576. That's Builder's Choice for all your flooring needs in the Memphis area. Again, the number, 901-602-6576. Chris, the teams with the most money on them to win the Super Bowl at the Westgate, which is actually where our buddy uh, Chris Felica is. So jealous. So we'll, we'll be talking to him shortly, but he's at the Westgate. Uh and this information is a little surprising. I'm going to give you the rundown, okay? Number five is the Steelers. Not not super surprising. Number four is the New York Giants. They got Evan Ingram in there. They got Paul Perkins, a running back. Like, that's that's a fantasy guy right there. I'm telling you. They brought Brandon Marshall in. Yep, Brandon Marshall. Yeah. He's going to be real good there. <laughs> Uh, so, uh, the Giants, I, I could see that. Lots of Giants fans out there. I could see why they would put some money on it. Number three, the Cowboys. Now, not uber surprising because, like, it is, quote-unquote, America's team. I get that. But, mm, Zeke being gone for six games and all that. Now, this was obviously before. Look, most of these tickets were probably cashed before our purchase, before the Zeke information came out. It Would it matter, though? I think the Cowboys are probably up there every year. Maybe, but I don't know that they'd be third. I mean, he is going to miss six games. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm with That's you. I'm with lot. you. So it, it, the Cowboys make sense, kind of doesn't, but it, you you could you could justify it. Number two is the Packers. Does that surprise you at all? No, Aaron Rodgers. That's it. Like it, the, the quarterback. quarterback. You know who number one is? I know who number one is. The Oakland Raiders. My Las Vegas Raiders. Soon to be the Vegas That's Raiders. That's right. They opened at twenty to one. They have been bet all the way down to six to one at the Westgate. Now, obviously, the lines are different across different boards in Vegas and whatnot. But the Raiders, across all of the Vegas sports books, have gotten the most money put on them. Now, for those wondering why the Patriots are not on here, 
Like, there's a couple of reasons, and these are just the ones that, you know, popped into my head. One, no team has won back-to-back Super Bowls since the Pats did it in 03 and 04. And two, the the Pats are the overwhelming favorites, which means, like, you're not going to win as much money. Ding, ding, ding. So, that's the biggest thing. According that's, to Vegas that's Insider. That's uh, th- Here are the favorites to win the Super Bowl, according uh, according to VegasInsider.com. Uh, the New England Patriots, they are 2.75 to 1, that's or 11, 11 to 4. 4. That is insanely yeah. high. It's, it's really, really, there's a lot to that. Um, the Dallas Cowboys are next at 8 to 1, which is insane to me. I don't get it. The Seahawks are 8.5 to 1. They're third. Number four is the Packers at 9 to 1. Number five is the Falcons at 10 to 1. Now, you've got four straight NFC teams there because nobody else even thinks that anybody's going to get out of the AFC. Yeah, the AFC, they're, they're terrified of. The Raiders are at 12 to 1. The Steelers are at 12 to 1. And the Giants are 14 to 1. So that's who you're looking at for for the Super Bowl this year. And does does any of them really stand out so much? I mean, the Cowboys and Seahawks, Cowboys. second, third. Oh, the Seahawks people really respect just because that defense is so good. They've seen that defense lead them to a Super Bowl championship. Yeah. And, um, you know, Russell Wilson should be better this year than he was last year. Offense should be a little bit better. Defense should be better. Defense should be better. So – now, that doesn't surprise me. The Cowboys surprised me. Even before the Ezekiel Elliott suspension, I told you I thought the Cowboys were going to have a massive uh, regression this year. Yeah. They, they, they are going to fall back to earth. And Zeke being out six games, I just don't don't see their offense being scary. Which, now, if it, like, we will be the first to admit if we are wrong. Oh, yeah. Uh, I'm because wrong all the time. if. If after six games he comes back and and they go on a charge, like if you get in as a wild card, you got every like oh, there are no. plenty of wild card teams that have made the Super Bowl. You're you're right on that. I just think they are going to struggle those first six games, and I don't know that a running back can lead a team to a Super Bowl like that. We've I agree. Seen, we've like seen, Dak is going to have to be otherworldly. We've seen receivers do it. Larry Fitzgerald's year. When him and Kurt Warner got together and they went on that Super Bowl run, lost to the Steelers, Fitz played outside of his mind. You cannot guard the air above everybody. And he just went up for balls. Kurt threw him up and nobody could cover him. I've never seen a running back just say, this is mine. I'm doing this. Yeah, I agree. I agree. Let's jump off the NFL. Let's jump into boxing right quick. Or MMA or wh- whatever the hell this fight is considered. It's it's yeah. a UFC Showtime event, right? Yeah, so no, this this sideshow. Like, yeah, sideshow. Let's jump into the sideshow. Mayweather and McGregor requested to fight with eight ounce gloves instead of the already agreed upon ten ounce gloves. Like they had to go into the Nevada gaming com- or Nevada. Uh, they had to get approval. They had to get it approved. Yes. And obviously, anything that Floyd wants, they're going to say okay to. Yeah, he is the cash cow. They don't want to piss him off. I get that. Upon hearing this news, what is your first thought? Uh, nothing really, because Floyd Floyd actually likes fighting with eight ounce gloves better. He's fought with them most of his career, so I that, I don't think it hurts him in any way. You would think it helped McGregor because McGregor's obviously going to try to knock him out. He has well, that's to. A, that was my first thought. It's it really benefits McGregor. Like that's the only way that he wins this fight is if he knocks Floyd out. But. You know what? What if there's something else to this? You know, I know you were saying that Mayweather is is comfortable with eight ounce gloves and whatnot. I, I look at it this way: like Mayweather has stated that he wants to give the fans a show. Like he basically acknowledged in his last few fights, including the Pacquiao fight, like that they were boring, and everybody is like mad at like he's always oh, just going to dance around for twelve rounds and da 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 da. And uh, do do eight ounce gloves make it easier for Mayweather? To get a knockout, like, is it possible that he is so confident that McGregor can't touch him that he's willing to take a risk of of allowing McGregor to get a better punch on him? No, I don't. I don't. I don't know that I'm. Wor- he's worried about about that. A, I'll answer these in a couple different stages. First, May- Mayweather's not knocking anybody out. Okay, McGregor, you don't think it matters? No, McGregor has been hit by by much stronger men than him. Yeah, with 
those what four ounce gloves that they use in UFC. Yeah, like there's there's Tiny. no there's no way on earth McGregor knocks him out. I will I will be Mayweather shocked. Knocks him out. Mayweather yeah. knocks him out. I will absolutely be shocked if that happens. I think there might be something to you know I I I I think they're selling this thing pretty hard, but he was on Mayweather was on with Stephen A. Smith. Um, on ESPN, he was talking about how he's lost a bit of a step. Maybe, and we talked about that the yeah, uh, the last show. Maybe, maybe if that is true, he wants the lighter gloves because it's easier for him to move with the lighter gloves to get his blocks up, things like that, not get him as winded. If any of that is true, then he would want the lighter gloves. McGregor wants the lighter gloves just for obvious reasons. He's going to try to knock him out. But I also saw on ESPN today, uh, actually, we record this on Thursday in the evening, that uh, that sports ESPN Sports Science did a thing where the difference between the the surface area that gets the the punch spread out to um, from the eight ounce gloves and the four ounce gloves is like one hundred twenty one percent. Okay, to where yeah. you know it, it covers such a bigger area, which absorbs a punch a lot easier. And with that being said, I don't know that there's a difference in the eight or the ten for Connor. I think they're both going to be absorbed about the same. So yeah. I don't know the way that others scared of that. I think this was maybe if he was telling the truth and his age is calling up to him and he's lost a step, maybe he wanted the lighter gloves just to have that little bit of weight off of him. I could see that. Either way, it does add a little bit, uh, a little different element. Another thing for us to talk about the fight, I guess we're going to have something probably come out every day, if I had to guess. Yeah. That's going to get people talking about it yeah, between we're, now and, and fight night. Yeah, we are less than... Uh, we, we, this Saturday will be a, will be a week. So. Friday show, so uh, so yeah, we're eight days. Eight days away. That is... Uh, I gotta tell you, I'm, I'm pretty fired up for the spectacle. <laughs> like, I know it's going to be... I know Mayweather's going to win. Now, now, if Mayweather is doing what he says he's doing, if he wants to put on a show, now I'm, now I'm interested. Yeah, but I have watched his last several fights, and they were absolute shams. Yeah, and and that's what got me so pissed off. Even if it's rigged or fixed, which I th- absolutely think it is, it is if it's entertaining, I'm in. I mean, I, look, yeah. I'm, a, I'm a I've been a Browns fan for a long time. My whole philosophy I stole this from Colin Cowherd years ago: be great, be terrible, but you have to be entertaining. Yes, find some way to keep Maybe eyeballs on the great. screen. The Browns are terrible. I, I, from what I've seen over the last couple of years, I don't want to watch either. Make us feel like our money was worth it. That's right. That's all it is. Mayweather's taken a lot of people's money. Yes, but he hasn't. He hasn't done anything to earn it. No, you you got that right. So. You got that right. All right, coming up next, we got ESPN's Chris Felica. We're going to talk some college football next on Winning Cures Everything on Local X. This is Gary Seegers from Winning Cures Everything, and I know you're looking for new gear for college football season. If that's the case, check out the new online store at winningcureseverything.com. We've got new WCE shirts in all sizes with all your favorite SEC colors. Just click on the store tab at winningcureseverything.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything with Gary and Chris on Local X. Right now, we want to welcome in a good friend of the program. You can catch him uh, this fall on ESPN's College Game Day and the Behind the Bets podcast. He is Chris Felica. Bear, welcome back, buddy. Things starting to pick up out at the uh, worldwide leader as we get closer to the season. Oh, yeah. We got, we're getting ready to uh, tape a couple shows next week for uh, season, pre- <clears throat> season preview type stuff. And then the week after that, we'll... Uh, We'll be back in full swing, starting off in Bloomington, the Ohio State Indiana game, and then take it down to Atlanta. Now, do you have two different stages set up for that, or do you have to take the whole stage uh, yeah. down to Atlanta? Okay, I was about yeah, to say no, good yeah, gracious. No, they'll, 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 they'll be they'll be they'll be a couple of different sets. There'll be a smaller set uh, in Bloomington for indoors, for inside the stadium, and then the the main set will be uh, getting set up in in Atlanta during that time. So yeah, there there, there will be, as far as I know, two different sets for. Uh, it, at least for week one. Logistically, you have to have one, and you always have to have a, a back one, backup one ready to roll anyway in case. Oh, absolutely. Anyone. So, uh, yeah, we'll have multiple crews and multiple sites, and it'll be a, uh, a busy first week, that's for sure. Now, the Bloomington show, I, I, I'm not even touching on the stuff that I wanted to touch on yet, but the, the one <laughs> for Indiana and Ohio State, now that whole thing, 
uh, it, that's like a mega cast thing, right? So, what is what all goes into this? Well, well, here, here's what's being done. There, there's going to be a, basically a four hour preview leading up to uh, kickoff for Indiana Ohio State. Uh, there's going to be a show from four to six, and they're going to be. Uh, I believe it's going to be Adnan Burke and Jesse Palmer and Joey Galloway. I believe. I don't want to. Don't hold me to the, the to the those uh, on air talent, but I think that's <laughs> going to be the case. And then from six to eight, we're going to have kind of what we're uh, we're doubling internally, like the uh, a, a game day light. It'll basically be a a two hour show inside the stadium, uh, leading up to the game, as opposed to a three hour show uh, outside where everyone can enjoy and yell and scream and have their sides in the background. So. Yes, um, so it's it's basically a five hour show and that, and that, over two days. Yeah, it's, yeah exactly. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, what's up with that? I mean, it, it's not a lot of work involved with that. But the no, mega cast is basically the mega cast is essentially what went on uh, last year. Um, for the you're going to have different ESPN channels are going to have different cameras, different uh, on air personalities, different angles. You're going to have. Uh, a Homer telecast, which is going to have uh, an Ohio State Homer, uh, a celebrity alum, former player from basically broadcasting the game from an Ohio State point of view, and then the other, uh, well, you'll have a an Indiana Homer. I think he might be uh, might be Dan Dockage, Dan Dockage actually, <laughs> uh, from, from what I heard. And so you get boy. back and forth with that. You'll 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 have like an Indiana radio feed of an Ohio State. So it'll be um, uh, kind of what they've done. You'll have an enhanced telecast. Uh, with, with some of the um, uh, the different stats that we we have going on, uh, different so I, is, pylon, is this pylon is, cam? Is, know, it know, is it an ESPN thing, or is it is it yeah. ESPN and ABC? Like, is this going to be every Saturday night for the the big ABC game, or is this only no, ESPN? No this, no, this is only only going to be only right now for the highest for the highest in Indiana game, and I'm sure it'll get broken out again for. Um, for the championship game, uh, as we've done the last couple of years, Man, Indiana got a good deal out of this, didn't That's they? Right, this should help. You don't right. They did, and they're they were they're one of the power five <laughs> schools that we have that we haven't been to yet. So they're they are loving it. Go on, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be, it'll be knock that one off there. the list. Check got, that one out. All exactly right. right. I, I think they're I think they're only about. Um, I, I don't have it committed to memory, but I think they're now are only nine power for nine or ten. Power five schools that we have not been to after, after this. So, and still uh, hadn't been to Wazoo. Uh, okay. No, <laughs> it's, it's killing it, isn't it? And and I, that USC game has to be on a Friday night this year, and that is absolutely yep. just uh, so mad. It's so frustrating <laughs> because that would have been the absolute perfect game to be there for. Oh, 100%. All right, now, the last time that we had you on, uh, in, it was in anticipation of the upcoming 30th season. We kind of went through uh, a history of college game day with you and Tim Brando. Today, we want to talk gambling, and we want to preview the 2017 season. Does that sound pretty good to you? Uh, if, if we have to, if we have to. <laughs> How many of these do you have to do a week? Like, is it is it just bananas? <laughs> it, 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 it's fun. I certainly don't mind doing it because it's it's a passion. It's talking about something I love. So, uh, <laughs> you know, it's been a, it's been a busy couple of days. I actually um, am out in Vegas right now with the uh, Westgate. Uh, Superbook preseason seminar where we kind of had some there was kind of some panel discussions and uh, VSIN broadcasts from Westgate. So Not hopped bad. on there earlier. So, it, so it'll be it'll be it'll be it, it's fun to just kind of uh, talk talk about the season with a bunch of different people and um, yeah, it, it's uh, it, it, it is busy though. But every time you do one of these, you kind of pick up something that you're. You, you, you say something you like, you say something you don't like. Uh, <laughs> people are interviewing you, make make a good point, and you're like, you know what? I haven't thought of that. So I mean, you kind of, kind of, kind of steal and borrow some thoughts or some people or some some questions that some people raise. So it's good. I got gotcha, you. I got gotcha. you. So you you jump from Musburger to us. I, I like that. That sounds good to me. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So let's uh, let's start off with some bigger picture stuff. Conference winners, over unders, all that kind of mess. Uh, it, we don't have to worry too much about it, but. Do you see any teams that might be kind of flying under the radar this year that could do something kind of the way that Oregon State did last year? They went four and eight straight up, but went nine and three against the number. They don't win a lot of games outright, but is there a team that that could keep everything closer than everybody kind of thinks they should? Yeah, I think Iowa State is a team like that in the Big Twelve. I mean, they're all they have some really good offensive players with Jacob Park 
and wide receiver who's really good. Uh, they scored a ton of points late, uh, nearly knocked off Baylor earlier in the year in Ames. And uh, they get a couple of teams in Ames this year that they might be able to uh, to put a little bit of a scare into. And uh, I think Iowa State might be one of those teams where you, know, you might look up and maybe they'll be 5-7, and 4-8, and 3-9. and nine, But um, – I think they're going to be a big dog in that league a lot of times to face some of those high-power offenses, and they can certainly score some points. So I think I think Iowa State might be a team to watch out for that might be a little bit undervalued, at least when it comes to against the number. Well, I wonder how, how much everybody would have loved Matt Campbell if he went somewhere other than Ames, you know? Like yeah, I, I, it, it, it's... You jump in? So, yeah, Bear, all right, so, <laughs> Sorry about Bear, that. No, you're good. <laughs> That's right. Bear, this is Chris. Right. Is, is there anybody that the media seems to love that you're not so enamored with this season, somebody that you feel like maybe, maybe we can bet against? Well, I, I think I think Oklahoma State is a team that even prior – I think this James Washington injury has the potential to be a real problem for them. I mean, hernias just don't go away <laughs> without <laughs> – Stitching, stitching him up and and staying off it, and I, I don't know if he's going to have to have limited practice time or if he's going to maybe miss some of the the non conference games. But if your best wide receiver has a hernia, I, I think that's a big off, that's a big problem for them. Uh, and again, you, you look at the you look at their schedule; uh, they got some road road games that are going to give them problems. I think uh, I touched on Iowa State before. And I think the Big Twelve as a whole is a conference that's going to be where most of the conference is going to be better than what it was last year. I think Iowa State will be better, and Kansas will be more competitive. Kansas State will be better. Texas will be better. TCU will be better. Baylor will be better with the with Matt Rule in there. The only two teams in that conference that I don't think will necessarily be as good as they were last year are Oklahoma, just because it's going to be impossible to be as good as you were last year without P. Ryan, uh, Mixon, and Westbrook. And West Virginia, with everything they lost defensively, uh, losing your best receivers, uh, e- even with Will Greer, I think that team has a lot of holes. So, so, so I think Oklahoma State's going to run into a couple of teams this year that might be much better. And remember, this is a team last year that needed a, a, bo- a box extra point by Texas Tech uh, t- to beat to be to be the Red Raiders that weren't very yeah. good. Oh, wow. So I, I mean, I mean, I mean, Oklahoma State, I think, might be a little bit overvalued right now. I, I think I agree with you. You brought up West Virginia. I'm I'm curious where you where you lie on this. How are they ranked number twenty in the in the coaches poll? I I was shocked. I, I don't know if they were coaches maybe were looking at a combination of A, we know Will Greer is there, and, and B, oh well they won ten games this year. They have to be good again this year. But if you look the three best teams they played last year, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, Miami it beat them by like a combined score of like 120 to 60. I mean, they, they were non-competitive games. Yeah. They had a couple of really, really fortunate wins. And, and their like schedule said, was the, amazing last year. Like, correct. the schedule I mean, set up great. And perfect. It, it, exactly. And, and they, they were all angry and upset. How are we not ranked in the top 10 when we're 6 and 0? Oh, and it's like, okay, uh, you, you are. And then you finally play somebody good and you got your doors blown off. But I mean, <laughs> you look at, I mean, you, you look you look at their schedule. The only I see, I see, Wins against East Carolina, Delaware State, Kansas, Texas Tech, and probably Iowa State. So that's that's five. I mean, after that, I, I mean, their schedule's pretty tough. Yeah. I mean, you got eight return starters. I mean, they they were a benefit of a turn. They were one of those turnover benefit teams last year. Turnover luck yep. went in their way. I, I, I'm I'm not singing it with them with them at all. Our, our football power index at ESPN gives them less than a 40% chance. And uh, I mentioned those five games that I think are probable wins. The other seven games, according to our numbers, uh, they have less than a 40% chance to win. So uh, I, I think wow. six and six is probably the most likely outcome for West Virginia. Maybe they maybe they get to seven and, and have a winning season, but uh, I, I certainly don't see them as a top 25 team. And neither do I. Neither do I. All right, let's, uh, let's jump into next week. It, the season starts early. And this is the first time I remember it being quite like this. It's, it tends to always be on a Thursday night. But the first game to kick off the season is next Saturday. And we've got four games that were all kind of moved and, and they're put up on the boards and all that. Uh, Oregon State at Colorado State is the first one. 
the Rams are favored by three and a half at home. I'm having trouble with this one. Now, it, like I said earlier, Oregon State went four and eight last year, but went nine and three against the number. Colorado State was kind of the same thing. They went seven and six straight up, but went 10 and three against the number. Like, both of these were teams that I absolutely loved. To, like, I hopped on the bandwagon and, and rolled with them. And now they're facing off in the first game. I'm leaning Oregon State here. Should I be, or or is this, you know, am I crazy for thinking the Beavers could pull this one off? No, you're not crazy. And I, and I think at three and a half, they, they're going to get really good two way action. And that's what Vegas is going to uh, want. And that's their goal every week when they throw up a number. Uh, personally, I like Colorado State in the game. If, if, I had to, if I had to pick a winner and, and play a side, I'd go with the Rams. They're opening up a new on campus stadium. I mean, Mike Bobo was really picked up uh, what, what McElwain left and, and run. Uh, Nick Stevens, who came back from injury last year, is back. His best wide receivers are back. Offensively, they're going to be really, really good. Uh, now, they gave up some big plays on defense last year, but the defense, again, it's one of those, oh, yeah, well, they got a lot of starters back on defense, but, yeah, they gave up a bunch of big plays and a bunch of points of times last year. So <laughs> you would think they might be a little bit improved. And in Oregon State, they've had – quarterback issues, offensive problems last year. I mean, they, they think that the Jake Luton kid can, can can really solve some of those problems, and, and Nall is a good back. But after that, they, I mean, Bolden is gone. They, they're really unproven uh, outside of, of Ryan Nall. So I, I think they might have a trouble scoring a ton of points now. Their just, defense made, made a big leap and uh, yeah. leaps and bounds improvement last year, but I, I don't know. I, th- I think all of the intangible type factors, I mean, you got to remember, too, it's a huge couple of weeks for CSU. They got Colorado right after that. And yeah. if they were able to knock off two Pac-12 teams uh, right off the bat, you, they could throw their name into the conversation as one of those group of five teams that could potentially be looking at. <laughs> right, at before they, uh, right before they go to Tuscaloosa. <laughs> <laughs> I remember they went to Tuscaloosa a couple of years ago when Mac was the head coach of Colorado State. And I remember giving out Colorado State plus a huge number in that game. And I was getting a while ago. Saban is not going to embarrass McElwain. Nope. It, it was like a it was like a, a, a total sandwich game for Alabama, uh, coming off of one huge SEC game right before another. I'm like, it, it's a perfect spot where they're just going to go out, do enough to win. Uh, they're not going to win fifty to nothing. It, it, it's going to be a never in doubt game but not a blowout. And sure enough, they went out, did what they had to do, and I think they wound up winning by a little, little more than two touchdowns or 17, something like that. Yeah. It was a, a, a bigger number than that. So, Chris, be honest here. Did you push to have game day go to Sydney, Australia? And uh, Yeah, <laughs> I, 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 try, I, I, tried for, I tried for Sydney this year just like a couple of years ago when, when Colt Brennan had that big year for Hawaii and they were undefeated. I tried to... Tried to get us out to Honolulu for the, uh, the Hawaii Washington game at the end of the year, but uh, unfortunately we couldn't fully uh, logistically get our television trucks. And I sat there in time, so unfortunately that, that the, uh, the game day Honolulu was um, uh, not, not going to happen. <laughs> did, but, did not uh, happen. So, so never, yeah. never probably going to happen. Or if if maybe Stanford was playing like an Oklahoma or a Georgia, you could you could swing that vote and you could you could get that to happen. I, I I am never a person who will say never because anything. It, 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 I, I always say two things: never say never, and there's no such thing as a sellout. There you can go. always find your way. That's, but, right, uh, that's right. Yeah, that's the truth. I, 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 I I'd be willing to say ninety nine point nine 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 nine. Carry out as long as you want. That hey, we won't be doing a game day from. Uh, from Sydney anytime soon. <laughs> All right, so that that is the ESPN game. David Shaw gets to go see a kangaroo, and his Stanford Cardinal are favored by thirty and a half in Australia. Now, look, Shaw's bunch had a lot of trouble scoring last year. Uh, they kind of picked it up late. I mean, not a bunch, but it is thirty too many here. Like, does that carry over at all they from last McCaffrey. year? Stanford, that's huge. Well, but they didn't it, have it in the bowl a big game. double. And, and remember, too, early last year, I mean, they, they played uh, Kansas State, who granted is much better than Rice. I mean, they had trouble scoring some points early in that game against a pretty good K-State team. The, the, the way I look at this game, Rice is not a very good team. But I, I think, I was talking about the Alabama-Colorado State game for a few years back. With Stanford having SC on the schedule right uh, right after that, 
I believe I, I think this is a game where Stanford kind of goes out and just kind of puts their feet in the dips their toe in the pool a little bit, feels the water, go, kind of go through the motions, work works on some things. I mean, they're not going to be threatened in this game. I mean, thirty is a tough number because I mean it it, it could be. It could be 30, 34 nothing, and Rice scores a late touchdown. I, I would be inclined to take the big number uh, in, a, in a game like this. I mean, Rice does have uh, a bunch of starters back from from a team that frankly wasn't very good this last year. And I don't know how good they're going to be this year. But like I said, I mean, it's one of those games I could easily see this 34 nothing, 35 nothing, 38 three, and then oh by the way, here here's your late your, your back door is open and. Uh, and Rice covers go. a big number, especially with Stafford looking at uh, potentially a big game against SC. Well, I would imagine in the second half of this game, they're going to have, you know, second, third everybody stringers in. Yeah, everybody gets to play yeah. in Sydney. And so that that makes sense. Let's, and, 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 go ahead. You're, you're, you're right, because I mean, I, I think they're expecting Keller Chris to be the guy, but they really like KJ Costello. So it, it would be a really good chance to get him some extended snaps as well if, um, if Chris isn't fully healthy. There you go. Now let's move over to the big one. You're going to be there on Labor Day Saturday, Alabama, Florida State. Bama is favored by seven. Now, aside from Clemson last year, like that's the closest line that Alabama has been favored by since the 2015 season. Last year it was tough for Vegas to come up with a number that was actually big enough for them. Is seven enough here, or is Florida State actually set up to uh, to knock them off and make it two straight wins for the ACC over the tide? Yeah, so that, that number's actually come up quite a bit because I remember uh... – when that when they first posted that number out in Vegas, I believe it was three and a half or four. Yeah, I mean, it was, it was getting low. A ton of money. Yeah, they they're, they're getting a ton, and that kind of surprises me because I think uh, I thought the action was actually going to go the other way. I mean, that seven's a tough number. Uh, I mean, if you look historically at save it against these ranked teams at Alabama in season openers, I mean they've done it five times, three times it's been a top ten team. They've won all five games by an average of 25 points a game, and all five of them have been by double digits. Yeah. Um, if you if you put me on the spot like you kind of are <laughs> right now, I would say I'd be right right now. I, I would say I'd be inclined to lay the points, uh, only because I, I I think the biggest question mark in the game is the Florida State offensive line, and yeah. I just don't know how well. A, they're going to be able to pass protect against some of those beasts that are on that Alabama front. And B, you've got Cam Akers, a true freshman, and running back for Florida State. How well are they, are they going to be able to open up holes for, for a kid playing his first college game? I mean, so it's a, the, the, uh, the, the exact of DeAndre Francois maybe getting put on his back about 17 times, and, and Cam Akers is a high school phenom who's going to be a great player like going against one of the best defenses in the country in his first game. That, 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 that doesn't bode too well for me. I, I think the I, I, you're, you're never going to look like a fool if you bet Alabama and you lose. That's and, and I've heard so many people say that. Like, I, I, so said, many people, I said that a lot last year. Yeah, there's a lot of people that take <laughs> Alabama just because they don't want to be known as the guy that went against them. No. So that, that makes sense. And I mean, like, yeah. Let's you jump into every now and then. Every now and then. Maybe the Clemson game last year because it was six and a half and you just didn't know, right? So Kiffin being gone and all that, it, like at that point, you know, it's just kind of up in the air. So why not take a shot, yeah. right? So and yeah, if you're going to do fact, that, just take the money line. Like, <laughs> yeah, and the, exactly. And the fact that uh, to that, in the title game the year before, you could have argued that Clemson was the better team and, and a couple of special teams break down to cost them the game. So, I mean, I mean the, the evidence was there that Clemson could easily go. Yeah. Toe to toe with them, and, uh, and people got a rematch, and, and hopefully, uh, if, if you like, if you like Tigers, you took them on the money line. There you go, there you go. All right, now the first game that ESPN is covering, uh, as far as the Labor Day weekend goes, Thursday, August thirty first, Ohio State at Indiana. We just talked about it. Uh, Tom Allen's first game as head coach at IU. Indiana made a bowl game last year, second uh, second year in a row. It was only what their eleventh bowl game ever. Both teams went six and seven against the spread in 2016. Now Ohio State had trouble at the end of the year scoring points. Uh, is this the vaunted Thursday night ESPN home underdog that we need to pay attention to? No, I don't think so. I, I, I think for a couple of reasons. Uh, first is the fact that Kevin Wilson 
is the Ohio State offensive coordinator, and I think he will probably do whatever he can to score as many points as he can, even if the game is no longer in doubt. I think I think there's certainly some ill will and some bad blood uh, with how he left and what allegedly went on and what allegedly didn't go on. So I, I think that, that that's first and foremost. I think the way, like you said, the way Ohio State played against Clemson, the way they played for much of the Michigan game, and the way the way they played against Michigan State uh, in depth offensively, I think they're going to be out to try and prove that they're past that, they're better than that. Uh, th- uh, thirdly, a couple of years ago when they were defending national champs, uh, they had a big Thursday night game. Actually, I think it was Monday night, but uh, actually the, uh, the game. The uh, Virginia Tech. State against Virginia. Against, yep. against Virginia. They started slow when they were in a game, and finally in the second half they pulled away once Michael Brewer got hurt. And, and I think a lot of guys uh, might still be around. Urban was around. I think he's going to want to make sure that doesn't happen again. Fourth, Indiana's weird. Indiana went from the, <laughs> with, with Wilson. And, and that's, that's the thing. They went from being this offensive juggernaut willing to get in 50 to 40 type games and now when they brought in Allen last year their defense was really really good I know Cobb is back and I know Richard Leggao is back at quarterback but they have a tendency just to turn the ball over a ton Ohio State's defense is really really good and I think they're going to have trouble scoring points I could see this being one of those um very it was one of those very rare favorite and under type games where you're where you're laying three touchdowns but it's to whatever the total might be, it might, it might sound to that because I, I can't see Indiana putting up more than say fourteen to seventeen points. Yeah, that's and I, I was I was very curious because you know they brought in Mike DeBoard uh, from Tennessee, who at the end of last season, uh, you know, for several of the games, Kentucky, Missouri, et cetera, et cetera. Now, obviously, those are not Ohio State defenses, but he was getting he was getting the ball around, and they were scoring. At will, basically. Uh, so that's that's why I was curious because I, I don't know what to expect out of Indiana. Uh, I think I know what to expect out of Ohio State. I, I like what you were saying about uh, about Kevin. Uh, I think he is. Yeah, you're right. He he's got some ill will towards them. Um, <laughs> yeah, he'll he'll be looking to embarrass them if he can. How about the coaching staff for Ohio State? That's I mean, just that, there insane. is just a, a slew of former head coaches. They're kind of the same that Saban does. I, I think Meyer, I think Meyer's smart. At the, I mean, it's a genius move. You got Shiano, you got Wilson, you got you know all sorts of people. Yeah, you're you're right, and I, and I think the way that went down last year, and I, I think Urban kind of knew that he had to shake this thing up. I mean, he did it defensively uh, a couple of years prior, bringing in Greg Shiano when, when Luke Fickle was still there. I, I mean, Luke didn't get that head coaching job after. He was the interim coach. They hired Urban, and Luke kind of hung around and played good, good soldier. And uh, Chana was brought on to to really be the nuts and bolts of that defense. I mean, you had Ash who left to go to Rutgers, and, and now, I mean, yet you had once Herman left, you basically were stuck with Ed Warner, and, and it was like <laughs> it was almost like they were coaching scared. Yes. And now you got Wilson, who who is a a brilliant offensive mind going back to the Oklahoma days. And don't forget about Ryan Day, who was the, the quarterback's coach. I mean, he's got an NFL lineage as well. He's a really good FCS quarterback at New Hampshire. Um, I, I would I would expect to see improvement from J.T. Barrett. Because I, I brought this up with a couple of people. That I, I think it's a fair question to ask, was J.T. Barrett great in 2014? Because he had Ezekiel Elliott, uh, Devin Smith, Michael Thomas, uh, Jalen Marshall, uh, an NFL tight end at Hireman, like Braxton Paul, Miller, an NFL first round offensive <laughs> lineman, Braxton Miller. He had all the skill around him. Was he uh, Tom Herman as a coordinator? Was he great because of that, or is he just, or was he great because he's a great? I, I think they're questions because when you lost, when he once he lost Herman, he was he had that Cardell Jones, mm-hmm. he, who's the quarterback, and he never really got into sync in, in fifteen, and then last year it, he just. It, 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 the, the 20-yard pass like wasn't even an option. I mean, they had zero threat. Of, it was either J.T. Barrett, quarterback, run up the middle, uh, jet sweep to Curtis Samuel, or or, or like a, a screen pass. So they they yeah. had no a downfield option. So, so I think you're gonna you're gonna see Day and Wilson kind of speed up the tempo when applicable and, and try and re- rebuild uh, Barrett's confidence and get 
uh, guys like McLaurin and, and, and Paris Campbell and some of the other young kids, uh, Benjamin Victor, as well, ball, the ball downfield. Well, that, it does remind me of um, uh, who who was oh, Josh Dobbs. Josh Dobbs of Tennessee, who who came on the scene really, really strong, and then as he progressed in his career, it, there was just not as much development. Like, it was almost like everybody kind of figured him out, and nothing else happened. You don't really hear about that in college so much, but it's almost like yeah, they got a book on him, and and, and once they and did, then it was done. Yeah, he couldn't he couldn't move the ball anymore. How did he go from being great to being predictable almost? Yeah. That's a, it, it. It scares me a little bit about uh, like Jalen Hurts at Alabama, you know, guys like that 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 come on and do something that other teams have not seen out of a certain team, and then you know you you jump into later on in their career when you would think they will be their like at their best when they're senior, but it's it's just kind of the same status quo. So you're just, yeah, it'll be interesting. It'll be it'll be interesting to see what you you brought up Hurts. It'll be interesting to see what happens with him. Uh, this year, because I mean, his, his passing ability has been criticized, and I think, uh, I think rightly so at times. But even again, he was a true freshman. But now you're going you're gonna to have struggles against Florida State right out of the gate. They are going to be calling for Tua like, like it's nobody's oh, yeah. business down at Tuscaloosa. And that, that, I don't know that, that that's really unfair for a kid who had an <laughs> unbelievable season as a freshman. And you, you lose to it. it, it say he struggles and they lose to Florida State, who's going to be ranked second or third when the AP poll comes out. I mean, that, that, that's a tough deal. I mean, he, for, for for a kid who had, had such a, a remarkable season last year and and nearly what, what, what scored what could have been the winning score in that, with that great run. I mean, he, he's under a lot of pressure now. Oh yeah, yeah. The guy, the guy to my left right now is is already waving the Tua flag. Already, already <laughs> sailing hurts under the bus, ready to move on. Couldn't win I, a national championship. I did that after change, uh, change up the next guy. After the national championship game, I immediately started saying that He's the Tua was going to win the job and and all that because I just you know when I was watching hurts, he couldn't throw the football. And now what I've seen out of practice and whatnot, like I, I think they're a lot better. I've I've got friends down in Tuscaloosa like Ryan Fowler who's a uh, Who's on the game uh, one hundred two nine down there and whatnot? They they're at practice every day, and they're telling me that uh, that Hertz has improved significantly. So we'll we'll see. You know, I, I'm I'm interested just to see what he's like this year. It, it's going to be a lot different, I think. He is an unbelievable athlete. He'll be fine. So Bear, let's close out Ooh. by a couple of easy questions for you. Okay, these are these are some softballs. You can't mess them up. <laughs> All right. Put put them on a tee for me. Exactly. Here we go. What's your favorite location from game day? And if you want to really upset some people and stir the pot, you can tell me your least favorite. <laughs> my, 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 my least favorite are usually the places that are really, really hard to get to, especially come late November when the weather is cold and you get a little ice and snow and, and things like that. You brought so, up uh, Purdue before, you, I believe. So you don't you, have to worry you, about your that. Imagine- Coming down the south. Yeah, I, I was going to say, I, 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 I don't think we're going to be headed back to West Lafayette anytime soon. <laughs> that was actually a really good game that we went to that year I mean, with uh, Kyle Orton and that Purdue team and yeah. and Killer. That that was a that was a fun spot and, and that kind of it's kind of a cop out answer. Any place we go for the first time, I love because it's new to us. It's new to the show staff. It's new to the fans. It, it, it's new to it, it's an entirely new experience. And, and and I love doing I love going to new places and experiencing new things. I, I think if you had, I think if I had to pick a couple of my favorite spots, like just in general, uh, Oregon is fantastic. Uh, Eugene is a cool little town. Austin is, 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 is having been there for the first time, and I think it was ninety eight uh, when we first went, ninety eight or ninety nine for the first time when we went to Austin uh, to see what it is now. It's been it, it, it's unbelievable the difference in the, in the facilities and how that program has gone. But so I think Eugene is a really cool spot, and, and, and Clemson's a great, a great little town as well. I mean, especially when the games are at night, uh, our, our location on, on that on the field is is terrific, and it, it's a really cool little atmosphere. There, I, I would say, I would say probably Oregon and Clemson would be amongst my uh, my, my favorites. All right. And then finally, winning's always fun, but as a gambler, it's like the bad beats stick in your head, 
and you can't get them out. <laughs> I, I know with exact certainty some of the worst beats I've ever had. I could give them to you verbatim almost how they played out. Tell me about a bad beat that you've had. What happened? How did it go down? Well, the, the Ohio State Northwestern game a couple of years ago was absolutely one of the worst bad beats ever. I mean, <laughs> there was never a point in the game where where Ohio State was covering the number until Northwestern was pitched the ball around and uh, fumbled the ball into their own end zone, and Ohio State recovered for the touchdown late to to win by uh, to win by ten or eleven and go and, and cover the number. And the other game was last year's Stanford UCLA game. I knew you were going to say that because that, 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 I took that, Stanford. That was, <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I mean, UCLA was the right side from the from the go, uh, and they should have won the game outright. And then to to to, to have that game end the way it did it was just a frustrating day. And I'm going to give you one more from last year that I can remember. It was the Alabama Kent State game, where uh, I, I think I gave out. Uh, at Kent State was getting like oh god, was it was it like 40, 40 something, 40, yeah. 48 points or something like that. And it was forty nine nothing, and Kent State had a fourth and goal, and scored a touchdown, and, and uh, that door cover beautiful. <laughs> and the replay booth calls down the field to review the touchdown, and they overturn it. And I'm like, it's forty nine nothing with like five minutes it. to go in the game, and, and, and it's not even like Alabama challenged the call. The replay, oh no, we want to review that overturned Alabama forty nine nothing. <laughs> Saban, Saban those, those, made a those, are, call. those are three really good ones. Saban, Saban made a call. Uh, see, I don't think so. That, that's Saban's alma mater. I I went with Kent State that day, so I know I know what Bear's talking about. <laughs> oh gracious, we we have kept you forever. He is ESPN's Chris Felica. You can follow him on Twitter at Chris Felica. See him on College Game Day every Saturday morning on ESPN starting September second. You can see him uh, Thursday, August thirty first, uh, live from Indiana. <laughs> Bear, we appreciate you coming on, Looking buddy. Forward. So we we got to get to, have had fun, guys. Oh, absolutely. We got to get out to game day at some point this season. Come and see you on set. Uh, and let's get you back on the show again sooner than that, though. All right. Absolutely. Any time, guys. Absolutely. Thank you, sir. We appreciate it. This is Gary, host of Winning Cures Everything. If you're looking for affordable custom web design, business cards, brochures, and more. Check out Kyle Seeger's designs at kyleseegers.com. Kyle offers full website design, monthly site maintenance, and content management system training. Remember, for all your web design needs, check out kyleseegers.com. That's K-Y-L-E-S-E-G-A-R-S.com. Welcome back to Winning Cures Everything on Local X with Gary and Chris. Chris, there was an article by Andrew Beaton in the Wall Street Journal on Wednesday that was titled, Freezes Ouster at Ole Miss Followed Calls to Escort Services on Recruiting Trips. Now, I will admit this, the title caught my attention, as I'm sure it did many. It does break a little bit of news that Hugh Freeze was in Tampa on the night of the infamous escort call. Uh, they got the flight records, so they, they saw where Freeze was going, and, what, and this was like... a. 18 city over 12 days or I mean it was crazy which college coaches do this makes sense um other than that like not a lot of news in this story it, it makes sense because it's written for a much broader audience than those of us who have followed this thing closely but it's not exactly groundbreaking that Freeze was riding in a university plane to go on recruiting trips and that he was calling escorts on the recruiting like we basically knew this yeah all of this stuff is stuff that people have been Speculating, attention. like they, yeah, people that are paying attention knew this, and then it, like, but we were all speculating, like we didn't have That's all right. of this stuff. So it's great that the Wall Street Journal finally got like their Freedom of Information Act went through their request. Um, what we have figured out, however, is that Ole Miss released Hugh Freeze's phone records yesterday. Uh, and that's the ones that Tom Mars wanted so badly, right? Houston Nuts attorney, AP reporter David Brandt stated on the Oxford Exxon podcast on Thursday that the document is 698 pages long. It's like 33,000 calls. And here's the kicker, right? About 5% of the calls are redacted. Now, if nothing comes out of this, you've got two different stories that that can come out, right? One, if there's nothing there, then why did you fire him, right? 
So, like, if there's nothing there, then there's got to be some other reason for this whole moral turpitude thing. And we've heard rumors. We won't say what the rumors are, but we have heard rumors from people close to that situation. Um, but two, if there's nothing there, why did you allow Freeze to redact the calls? Like, the other question is this, right? So if they're private phone records, why did Ole Miss even release them? Yeah, like, why, tell, tell me that. Well, that's a question we don't know. Why did they release them the first time if they're private phone calls? Well, the first time it was only like three days, right? And I, I think that their legal counsel was terrible enough to not realize that it was not a state phone. I'm going to bet they released them this time because it is a state phone. Well, but if it is a state phone, then they legally cannot redact calls. Any calls. Which is why... I'm Because you're not going to find anything in this. Like, Hugh Freeze has had plenty of time to go through and redact anything that might be incriminating and just claim, oh, it's a personal call. Mm -hmm. Like, you can see, like, the the number is redacted, but it'll show you, like, the city and all that. And there's 33,000 calls, of course. Like, you're going to run into stuff in, like, all sorts of different cities and whatnot. Like, guys are going to have to go through this with a fine-tooth comb, and they're not going to find anything. Because the calls that matter are redacted. Period. Well, my question is this. I don't know about that. If I mean, obviously, they screwed up the first time. If they have cities and, and dates and times next to them, and that part is not redacted, just the number, then he shouldn't be having phone numbers from all these different crazy places redacted. Because that's not personal. That's kind of that's my agreement here. Like, like the only like they're not reason, going to find anything the because they can't get the numbers. You would have a have a local number redacted for personal use if you were in you know whatever city. Recruiting. Well, here's the here's the thing they they can't release like or not can't but according to this they don't want to release uh, student athletes phone numbers and whatnot. Totally understandable because if they're recruiting like number one guys out there and whatnot like. People will find these numbers and publish them, and it'll go out on Twitter. Kind of like LSU did with Tim Tebow's number yeah, back forever ago. Yeah. Like, you get the point. So you want to keep that out of the media, but at the same time, like, allowing him to redact numbers, like, I, I don't – you see where my questions this, this come is a in. Different, this is a different situation. If it's a recruit and you have access to that number – then the lawyers should be able to have access to that number. Yes, I agree. And if it gets leaked out, then these people sign, you know, confidentiality agreements. And if it, you know, minimum number of hands have access to it, and if the number gets leaked out, then there is liability there. Well, here's the problem. It is a a, a state phone, which means that Nothing no be calls can be redacted. redacted. That's what I was about to say. Nothing should be redacted. Yeah. Like I, it's a state phone. So, and I wonder if the, the state's going to come back if if Thomas Tom Mars, Mars will be the one to come out and say we want we want all the redactions removed. Yeah, like we need the whole thing. Yeah, I because want the this whole is thing. this is bull crap. That's right. Reprint that and just and take them little that. black boxes off of it because right. you didn't give me what I wanted. That's right. And you can't tell me. And he'll subpoena for the numbers if he has to. Yeah. You know, I'd, I'd guarantee that. If it's a that. state phone, he'll win that. He'll get, he will get. Well, no, even because it is for a lawsuit, he will get it no matter what. That's right. You know, he if he subpoenas the numbers, like, you know, if I'm in a lawsuit with somebody, they can subpoena my bank account. That's right. You know, like it doesn't necessarily have to go public, but. Well, and therein lies the thing. Things get subpoenaed all the time that don't go public. Exactly. So, like, that's it. Look, Mars wanted this for his case. As he told us on the uh, on the site on during the interview, like he's not looking for hookers. Yeah, he's looking for journalists. That's right. He's looking for sports writers. Like if you're redacting numbers, and if they are to different cities and all that kind of mess, there ain't no telling. No, that's you it. Know? Like if you go to redact numbers and they're all Oxford numbers, and we're just assuming that's where your mama lives, then then I get it. I don't need her number, and I don't care. Yeah, but if you're redacting you know, numbers to other area codes all over the country. No, I need to see all those. Yeah, then it's a problem. I need to see them all. And I don't care that it's a recruit and you're afraid that his number is going to get leaked out. It doesn't matter. All right. Enough of that. Let's jump off that old Miss stuff. Let's uh, let's dive into the Friday Five. 
The Friday Five is brought to you by Kyle Seeger's Designs. If you need great, affordable web design for your company, business, or just personally, check out kyleseegers.com. He can handle all of your web development needs, including site building, maintenance, branding, and more. For more information, visit Kyle Seeger's Designs at kyleseegers.com. Number one, Diedrich Lawson, former Memphis Tiger, recent transfer to Bill Self in Kansas, although he is currently suspended from the team. Uh, he apparently walked out on a nearly $100 bar tab at Bar Louie in Overton Square in Memphis late Wednesday night, around 1.30 a.m. Thursday morning. Uh, the waitress who knew him from high school, which how dumb do you got to be, uh, said that his tab was $88.20, that he walked out of the restaurant, got into a black Nissan Maxima, which then drove off. Now, at first off, let's jump into that. That's like four incidents between KJ and Diedrich since they both transferred Correct. from Memphis. So let, let me know if I'm missing one. First, like KJ yelling F Tubby in a Snapchat video that went public. Like yeah. that became a huge deal. Mm-hmm. KJ and Joe Jackson getting into a fight. Talks about guns being pulled during a pickup game at White Station or whatever. Quite possible. Like that's crazy. Uh, Diedrich got suspended from the Kansas team uh, before their trip to Italy. Like it was an incident on the court. Well, we don't know what. We don't know was, exactly what, it was, but it, it, was, it, it was, was bad enough that he got suspended. Like Josh Jackson never got suspended last year, and he beat some girl's car in. Yeah, I was about to say like, they give me had a break. some things in Kansas that they didn't get rid of him for. Exactly. Uh, and Diedrich walking out on a tab at a restaurant in Memphis. Now, Diedrich went on ninety two nine ESPN in Memphis today with our boy John Martin, and he claims that he did not walk out on the tab. He said, "If I ordered those drinks, I would have paid for it." And the the owner at Bar Louie came out and said, oh, he's, you know, Diedrich is a great patron, all this kind of mess. I, I get it. So, first off, is Tubby Smith looking better and better every time these kids goof up? Oh, yeah. I mean, you and I kind of talked about that when he let him go. I understand it's hard to let talent walk out the door. But if but talent is tearing your team apart, and I'm not saying that he was, I'm saying that the, Tubby, I, Tubby may have said. we didn't see. Yes. He may, like, Tubby probably wanted to try and fix the kids because they can play basketball. That's right. They're good at that. Like, those two were the best two players on the team last year. Bottom line. The other part of this is Diedrich is 19. Like, I've been to Bar Louie several times. That is a 21 and up establishment, right? That's right. So, like, the story doesn't say that he had alcohol in his tab. I'm not saying he was drinking. But does his age mean anything to this story? Like, if you were a 21 and up establishment... Can you be allowing 19-year-olds in? So I do have a question about that because he, he is the one that used the word drinks. Now, I don't know about you. That that can mean Coca-Cola is not. It'll never but, hold up in a court of law. But here's the problem. <laughs> I'm not worried about that. That's fine. I'm not worried about court of law stuff. We're worried about public perception and all that stuff, right? How do you rack up an $88 tab on drinking Coca-Colas, man? They don't well, charge the about a Coke. I, I, he said that the drinks were not for him, that, that they weren't his drinks. Yeah, so apparently it was alcohol, though. Yeah, it, but I mean, was it his? Was it you know? There's a and, lot and of. You're right. If you're supposed way, to be 21 to get in, how are you 19 and in there at 1:30 in the morning? That's right. Like even if it was like even if it was 18 and up until a certain point, it, it ain't 18 and up until 1:30. That's right. Like that's crazy. Like the whole thing just something stinks. Like what are you doing out at 1:30 in the morning on a Wednesday night? Nothing, like, nothing good happens you, after You're already night. suspended from your team. Like, go make Memphis proud. Yeah. Do something reasonable. Like, jeez, sit at home, man. Nah, it's not Hang out with your dad. That ain't happening. Jesus Christ almighty. All right, number two, former Memphis Tiger star Joe Jackson arrested on felony drug and gun charges. He was arrested on Wednesday night. Uh, tell me what is going on with these former Tigers, man. Like, this is very frustrating. To, to hear this kind of stuff go on. Um, here, let me read you a part of the story, all right? So, former University of Memphis basketball star Joe Jackson was arrested on Wednesday night da-da-da, on felony gun and drug charges, and his bond was set at $35,000, according to police and court records. Uh, Jackson, a Memphis native, was charged with possession of a controlled substance with the intent to manufacture, distribute, or sell as well as possession of a firearm while committing a felony. He also faces an additional misdemeanor charge for possession of drug paraphernalia and a misdemeanor charge for an improper turn. The improper turn is what got him pulled over. Uh, He was arrested on Tresman Street during a traffic stop at 6.30 p.m. on Wednesday. 
He was driving a brand new 2017 Chevy Camaro. An officer said when they approached the car, they smelled a strong odor of marijuana coming from the vehicle. That part is not surprising. No. The part that he had uh, enough in his backpack, in the ba- which I'm not going to read the rest of the story, but there was a lot of stuff in his backpack. Well, like a hundred ecstasy pills. I was just about to say it a bunch of weed. It doesn't make me feel like it's all weed because I've been the guy that's kind of the weed defender on this thing. It, it, it's you know when you are looking at manufacturing drugs and they're using that terminology and things to manufacture drugs. Yep, that that sounds more like meth. Well, here's here's the rest of it. So uh, they asked if they could search the vehicle. They found a Louis Vuitton backpack in the back passenger seat that, quote, smelled like raw marijuana, according to the affidavit. When officers opened the backpack, they found a pill bottle filled with 100 various colored pills that had symbols of a naked lady, a four-leaf clover, a Superman symbol, and a dolphin printed on them. For those that do not know, that is ecstasy. I'm not saying that I know. (laughs) I'm just saying... But I heard from a guy. But I heard from a guy that knows. Yeah, he knows. So, that is ecstasy. Anything that's got those crazy-ass symbols on them or whatever, that's, that's, that's X. Flat out. Be careful. Tread lightly. Exactly, because you never know what's in those things. That's right. So as far as manufactured and whatnot. Uh, anyway, officers also found a forty caliber pistol under the driver's seat and a loaded twenty two Celtic pistol uh, in the backpack with the drugs. Police also found $4,500 all in $100 bills in the backpack. It's just frustrating. Tough night. It's just frustrating. Tough, tough, tough night. Like Bond said at $35,000. Like, Joe, man, I understand that you ain't in the NBA, but, like, you know, come on, do something, man. Tough, tough day for the for the former Tigers. It's, it's so frustrating. God bless America. I just get so irritated. Uh, all right, so number three on the Friday Five, a male stripper in Tampa named Justin Calhoun. I had to tell you this story. This is, like, so I read this breaking news story, uh, article, whatever, website every day, and I just see some of the great. So we had the sex robot thing the other day, right? Yep. So on, uh, on episode 111. Like, sex robots that look like deceased spouses. And the story behind that was just nuts. So, this, a male stripper in Tampa named Justin Calhoun was arrested on the charge of attempted murder earlier this week. And I got to read you a big chunk of the story, okay? It's it's not long, but it's, it's a little bit. <laughs> According to a Key West police report, Calhoun admitted to attacking Mark Brand so severely that the victim was flown to a Miami hospital to be treated for his injuries. Calhoun told police that he and Brand had a sexual relationship and that he often stayed at Brand's home in Key West. Calhoun said he and Brand got into an argument because he believed <laughs> that Brand was a cannibal. Detective nice. Jeff Dean wrote in the police report. <laughs> nice. Brand I'm got intrigued. Uh, Brand got angry about Calhoun's accusation and picked up a gun that was on a bed where they were laying. Uh, Calhoun said the gun fired as he fought with Brand for the gun, but no one was shot. Uh, Calhoun said he took the gun and planned to shoot Bran, but the gun jammed. Uh, Instead, Calhoun said he grabbed a pen and stabbed Bran in both eyes. Oh, golly. Then... We're getting some Game of Thrones action going on here. Then Calhoun stabbed a piece of wood from a broken dresser into Bran's mouth, quote, to silence him, he told the police, the report said. Calhoun stomped on the piece of wood to lodge it further into Bran's mouth, grabbed a drawer from the broken dresser and used it to hit Brand, the report said. Calhoun said he locked the door to keep Brand's roommate from entering, grabbed his money and backpack, and jumped out the bedroom window while naked, the report said. He was caught several hours later after evading police by jumping fences and climbing on rooftops. He was naked, jumping fences and climbing on rooftops. Calhoun admitted that his actions went beyond self-defense. Uh, yeah, I bet. Um, I'm going to bet there's some of those maybe uh, crazy pills involved in this story as well. That dude is still alive after all that. I don't want to be. Good. Both eyes stabbed, had a piece of wood lodged in his throat, and then stomped on, on and got hit with part of a dresser? Like, give me a break. The gun jammed. What was he going to do? Like, kill him? That's that. Well, yeah, like, obviously. I mean, I, I, I think he was trying to. The, be, the best thing that could have happened to that guy was the gun going off. Yeah. And just boom, bullet in me over. Yeah. 
Because oh, this is who no way to God live right bless here. America. I, like so these, some minute. of these stories are just I want to know so insane. First thing, this does not shock me that this comes out of the great state of Florida. Okay, <laughs> this just does not. Now nah, listen, like every radio show or podcast I listen to has some type of Florida Man Friday stuff going yes. on. Okay, so this is about par for the course. I love it. It's awesome. But he. This all started because he accused him of being a cannibal. Yes. Now, that's... I want to know, are the, are the police investigating that? Because maybe we should put a bullet in Brian. Like it, I mean, maybe somebody should. I, it, all of it sounds so outlandish. What if they find out homie really is a cannibal? Well, in that case, I mean... It, then, it, then, like, Calhoun's instantly, like, off. Let me get on the jury of peers. I'll vote you off. Do yep. not, you know, if whatever. you were actually eating people, if this cat's eating people, good good job on poking his eyeballs out and smashing his teeth in. Yeah, cheers to you, buddy. What is going on in Florida? That's some crazy stuff in Key West, those, man. How many of those ecstasy pills you think were involved in this? Probably, probably 30. enough. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> There's, no, you wouldn't have to have a bunch to get no. to this level, I don't think. No, you, but it depends on what kind of bath salts they put in them down there. I mean, geez, like this, some crazy stuff. That, that is good lord wild. jumped out the window. And go jumping over fences and climbing roofs naked. Naked. Like, good Lord. You don't want the fans to catch it wrong. Oh, my God. Number four, ESPN was criticized for their fantasy football auction clip where a group of white guys were bidding on Odell Beckham Jr. for their fantasy teams. Sean King and the rest of the social justice warriors called him out, saying it looked like slave trading, and then ESPN apologized for it. Now, now this, this makes me mad. What What do you make of that? Like, should ESPN have apologized? Like, that's what pisses me off more. Or is it like the social justice guy's fault for not understanding what a fantasy football draft auction looks like? Somebody should have explained it to him. Well, okay. I think ESPN tried to, I think, but, but like, they apologize. Like, don't apologize. No, don't apologize. Just explain your situation. Listen, we are going, in a couple of weeks, we are going to have a big ass fantasy football auction draft in my house. It's, it's one of the funnest, best ways to play fantasy. You have to auction the players off. It's the best fairest way to do fantasy football i'm a big nerd i know this stuff one thing that i used to get upset about is you watch all of these fantasy shows on espn and and which was at, for the longest time the only ones that had a show that explained any of this stuff to you they never cover auction drafts they never talk about it they just say draft these guys in the first round draft these guys but if you're doing an auction you can't do that you have to strategize completely different yeah so, they're doing like a big 28-hour fantasy football day or whatever. And they take a big section of the day, and they dedicate it towards auction drafting. And they're teaching people, this is how it works, this is the values of guys, this, that, and another. And there's no way to do it other than somebody nominating a player, predominant part of the league is black, and and everybody everybody drafting, everybody bidding on these people. That's That's what you're doing. And there's no other way, there's no other way to do it. Yeah. And I know that something awful happened years ago that involved this type of stuff for a, a very heinous thing. But that's that's not at all what this is about. I mean, this is the nerdiest people that you can think of that like sports. Yes. Okay. It, that's all it is. There's no need to apologize. I don't like the apology. And I just like, if wish, they had not used Odell Beckham, if they used Tom Brady. Tom Brady and Aaron Rodgers, and they were auctioning off two quarterbacks, the, the two best quarterbacks this year. Like, it would have been fine. Probably, there there would have been no issue. Probably. But instead, it's guys that don't understand it, and the, the clip went viral. Yeah. And everybody just immediately turns Everybody wants to be offended by something nowadays. But, but at, you know, they used Odell Beckham. But Odell Beckham might be, is probably the most popular player in, in football. Yeah. He's the he's the model person that you want to use. Exactly. I don't That's I don't why ESPN used him. That's why that's why they used him. Like he's in all these ads and everything. Like he's no, he's not the like I don't think he's the best teammate. I don't think he's the best no, player. I don't think he's the best is, receiver. He is he is the most popular he's, guy. He is one of the faces of the NFL right now. That's right. That's, that's the way right. it goes. So all right. Number five, and to close this out, Dave Portnoy at Barstool Sports has printed up seventy thousand of the Goodell clown picture towels. To hand out for Patriots opening night against the Chiefs on Thursday, September seventh. Seventy thousand. 
Like, this isn't retaliation to Goodell showing up to a, a preseason game no. and taking a picture with three smiling Pats fans. No, he was like, going to do this before Goodell showed up to the preseason No, he was going to show – like, he was going to do 30000 Oh, okay, all right. So he and then he it. jumped it to seventy because Goodell posted that picture with him and the Pats fans. Yeah. Like, and he snuck into one of the preseason games at, at – uh, So there are a lot of people that think because he snuck into that game that he's not going to show up on Thursday for the opening night. Well, I was already – I was just there. I showed up that preseason game. How much does Barstool hate Goodell? A lot. Like, I, I, do you think it's all of them, or is it just mainly like? Oh, it's Portnoy? all just no, it's just the Pats fans, which it's, is Portnoy. Portnoy. It is a couple other Pats fans there too, but but yeah, no, it's it's Dave. Yeah. And hey, Dave, if you're listening, I'm sure you're not, but how at your boy. I want one of those towels. <laughs> like, I'm not going to be, gonna be the gonna game. Be make the game. All right. Just. But to, if you got any left over, I got a job, and I can't go to Boston for a football game, but. Not on a Thursday, anyway. No, not, not from Thursday. Memphis. Yeah. So, all right. I don't have the cheese. Good I gracious. Want one of those I'm yeah, gonna, I could. I could see that. I'm gonna that. go on eBay and try to buy one after it's over with. You know they're gonna be selling them. Oh yeah, yeah. You're probably right. This is, oh, there's gonna be a lot of them. Up, don't beat me up too bad on price. Just, just let him probably get one. Yeah, just hook him up. Hook him up. All right, that's gonna wrap it up. Winning cures everything. It's time for the rundown. Remember, check out winningcureseverything.com. You can give us a like on Facebook, facebook.com slash winningcureseverything. You can follow us on Twitter, at winningcures. You can follow myself, at GaryWCE. You can follow me at Chris B. Giannini, C-H-R-I-S-B-G-I-A-N-N-I-N-I. You can also email the show, that's winningcureseverything at gmail.com. And we now have a voicemail line. That number is 551-226-9899. If you want to call and bash us for talking bad about your favorite team, or praise us, or just tell us about how awesome your team is doing, leave us a voicemail. That number again is 551-226-9899, and we may toss it on the show. Thank you for supporting this show, and until next time, have a good one, guys. Hey, don't forget, subscribe to the Winning Cures Everything podcast on iTunes and make sure you leave a review. For every 25 written five-star reviews we get on iTunes, we are donating to St. Jude's Children's Hospital and Le Bonheur's Children's Hospital in Memphis, Tennessee. So subscribe and review on iTunes, SoundCloud, Google Play, and all your favorite podcast apps. Remember, the Winning Cures Everything podcast.